Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The title of the sermon this morning is The Goodness of Hardship. The Goodness of Hardship. The big idea I hope to impress upon you from these four verses of the book of James is that you not the person sitting next to you, not the person sitting in front of you or behind you, not the person you work with, but you personally, the person in, whom's, in whose ears my voice is bouncing. You, you must change the way you think about trials. So when I say you, do you know who I'm talking about? Is that clear? And you must change the way you think about trials. As we work through this passage, I'm going to take two, two headings, two points. First, there will be a meaningful introduction and then a motivating imperative. A meaningful introduction and a motivating imperative. Before we get to that first point, I just want to get your brain working a little bit, okay? So think with me, a little bit of creative thinking, memory use. When was the last time you changed your mind? Go ahead, think about it. When was the last time you changed your mind? Some of us might be accused of always changing our minds, while others take pride in the fact that I've done it this way and I'm never changing my mind. In a sense, we all change our minds on a regular basis. We might have our minds made up about dinner, right? We're just dead set on getting the beef, and then when the waiter comes over, it's like, all of a sudden, i got to get fish, right? Our minds change. We might be thinking, I am definitely wearing a blue, shoot, blue shirt tomorrow, and then tomorrow comes, and I don't know why, but I can't wear that blue shirt. Our minds change quickly about some things. In other ways, your mind doesn't really change all that frequently in any real sense. It's one thing to change about silly little things like that, but your mind doesn't really change all that quickly about significant things. It's a remarkable thing when someone who hates exercise says, I love exercising. My mind's changed. That doesn't happen every day, right? It's a, it's a remarkable thing. It's a rare thing when someone who hates vegetables starts happily eating vegetables. That kind of mind change isn't normal. It's rare. It's very unexpected when someone changes their mind about the president. It's rare to see someone change their mind about a rival sports team. Right? You think about it, these things that are in our minds, your mind doesn't really change too much on some of those things. It, it, it can, it will, but it's not super frequent. But as Christians, we are a people who've had our minds changed. Every one of us. If your mind hasn't been changed, you can't be a Christian. Every one of us, as Christians, once thought a certain way about God. We used to think a certain way about ourselves and our sin. 
We used to think about Jesus in one way, but now, by the work of the Spirit, by God's work of grace, we think differently about all of these things. This change of mind is called repentance. We don't think the way we once did, and our thoughts are becoming more and more and more conformed to God's way of thinking and less like our own way of thinking. Our passage this morning requires us to change our minds. So let me ask you again. When was the last time you changed your mind? I hope to cultivate in you a humble sense of prayerfulness that says, God, my mind doesn't really change that much. And the pastor just said that this whole passage is about my mind changing. God, change my mind. Because I can write really good sentences and really good paragraphs, right? Even a blind squirrel gets lucky sometimes, right? But if you don't have within yourself a heart ready and willing and eager to change, and if, you, if God doesn't attend to your prayer for change, your mind will not change. And so any hope I have of doing my job this morning in an effective sense is completely dependent upon the spirits working in this room. I would love to snap my fingers and feel differently about exercise. I would love to snap my fingers and feel differently about a lot of things. But unless the spirit comes and changes our minds, we won't get there. And so I hope and I pray, I pray that God will come and do a a work in all of us this morning, that our minds might be changed, not just generally, not even about exercise or vegetables, but about the way you see trials. Point number one, verse number one, a meaningful introduction. The very first thing we see in our text is that it's written by James. Who is James? James. We read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, that after Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, he then appeared, quote, to James, then to all the apostles, and then the apostle Paul. In Acts 12, 17, Peter miraculously escapes prison and then tells some of some disciples who were gathered together, he said to them, go and tell James and the other brothers that I'm no longer in prison. In Acts 15, James is speaking at the Jerusalem council as the church accepts Gentile Christians into the fellowship after Peter's testimony about how God had given his spirit to the Gentiles. Paul interacts with James and the other elders in Jerusalem in Acts 21. The author of this book, The very first word of the book of James tells us of a man who saw the resurrected Jesus Christ and it played a remarkably important role in the early church in Jerusalem. For someone to be named among the apostles, to be named among the disciples, to have his name on the lips of Peter and on the lips of Paul, to be considered one of the elders in Jerusalem, and to have a speaking role as the Jewish church was accepting Gentiles, seeing God bringing the Gentiles into the church. This is a remarkably important man. It should come as no surprise that a man such as James would be, who was sitting in a, in a position of leadership in the early church, would write a letter to the churches, would write a letter to help Christians. It should come as no surprise. If you don't know who James is, that, that kind of makes sense. He's not up on the, his name isn't first on the billboard like a Paul or a Peter, but James is, is significant in the role of the early church particularly in Jerusalem, and particularly amongst Jewish believers. Paul would speak of James in Galatians 1, verses 18 and 19. He writes, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, 
Whoa. Hold on a second. Who? James, the Lord's brother. Did you catch that? Not only is James, our author, a significant person in the Christian church in Jerusalem, but he's also Jesus' younger brother. This man, James, the author of the book of James, called Mary his mother. Just like Jesus. He grew up in the same home with Jesus, Mary and Joseph, and was there to watch Jesus grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It's no wild stretch of the imagination to think that Jesus and James shared a bedroom or even a bed. Jesus and James would get into his little spats. Whose turn is it to clear the table, right? Jesus never sinned, right? But brothers living together, James had a unique experience of Jesus Christ. He was in the same home as him. Jesus was his big brother. But what is maybe even more intriguing than this is to learn about James in John 7, verse 5. In John 7, verse 5, we read, not even Jesus' brothers believed in him. And in Mark 3, 21, as the crowds were gathering and pressing in on Jesus, we read, when Jesus' family heard about it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he, Jesus, is out of his mind. James is a significant figure in the Jerusalem church, this significant figure, this significant man in God's working in the church. He grew up with Jesus. I have no idea what it's like to live with a brother who never sins. But in all fairness, neither does my brother. This man lived with Jesus, and he didn't believe in him. And when Jesus started his public ministry, James tolerated it. And then when it started getting in the newspapers and everybody was going crazy for Jesus, James said we have, he was among the group that had to go get Jesus because they thought this man is crazy and he's going to get himself killed. The second thing we see about James, not only is he the significant play the significant role in the early church, not only is he Jesus' younger brother, not only is he a, a man who previously thought of Jesus as being crazy, but James introduces himself as a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you feel the beauty of that phrase? Little brother says, I'm a slave. I'm a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. James, James doesn't think about Jesus the way he used to. And as James is telling us who he is, as he's beginning this letter, it's important as we read, he's telling us that he's a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important to realize that he could have touted his family connection to Jesus. He could have said, I was there when, when Jesus burned dinner. I was there when Jesus gro was growing up. I knew Jesus before he had a beard. He could have said all of these things, but he didn't. He could have touted how important he was, that he was sitting amongst the elders in the Jerusalem council. He could have said how important he was because he was named among the other apostles, but he chose to identify and reveal himself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know not all of you are convinced yet, and many of you are interacting with people who aren't convinced that Jesus is God. But think about what a mighty, mighty apologetic, what a mighty argument it is for a man to say, I grew up with Jesus, and I believe that he is God. This introduction challenges us in a couple of ways. Okay? First, James is a man who once didn't believe in Jesus and even thought that Jesus was crazy. But at some point in his life, 
James repented. James changed his mind. His mind was changed about Jesus. And so let me ask each and every one of you this question. Have you changed your mind about Jesus? Every one of us is born with a thought about ourselves, with a thought about God, with a thought about Jesus. Can you point to a time in your life, or can you point to signs that say, I don't think the way I used to think about Jesus? Every believer can say, I don't think about Jesus the way I used to think of him. And considering what James says, calling Jesus Lord and God, have you rightly seen Jesus as God and as Lord? Christian, do you believe that God still does this same work today? Do you believe that that unbelieving family member, I'm getting down to brass tacks, I'm not just talking about general principles, right? Do you believe that that unbelieving family member, that unbelieving coworker, that unbelieving neighbor or friend can be radically transformed in their thinking about Jesus? Do you believe that? It's easy to work with people and to live with people and think, People don't change their mind. That guy, for sure, is not ever going to repent. But let me tell you, that thought that's rolling around in your mind is completely of your flesh and completely of the evil one. God is in the business of changing people's minds. And James is a clear testimony that God does that. Do you believe, Christian, that other Christians in your life can be radically changed by Jesus. Repentance is not just the work of unbelievers. We don't repent once, check it off our box, and move on. Many of you are Martin Luther fans, and you know that he had 95 theses that he nailed to the, the door at Wittenberg. Number one, Drew's paraphrase says, The whole of Christian life is repentance. Repentance is the vehicle a Christian steps into and never steps out of. Do you believe that that person in your life, that even Christian, that they can repent? That they can be drastically, remarkably, miraculously changed? Don't stop believing. Don't stop praying. Don't stop talking about Jesus with the people in your life. Anecdotally, it's a joy for me to stand here, and I, could, I won't point, but there are several of you in this room when I look at and I say, even in a short amount of time I've known these people, I've watched God change them. You're not the way you were. The Lord has done a work of repentance in you, and it's a beautiful thing. James isn't the only one who knows what it's like to be transformed. I'm not who I was. By God's grace and give glory to God, I'm not who I, once, who I one day will be. And that's true of every believer in this room. And some of you are sitting like trophies on a shelf for me. An encouragement to me. Because I've watched you repent. And I've watched your minds and your lives be changed. And that's a beautiful thing to me. Secondly, we haven't even gotten half, we've only gotten halfway through the verse, first verse, but we're already meeting another challenge. And that it, it challenge the, challenges the way we view ourselves and the way we receive this letter. Okay? James isn't just throwing words on the front of an envelope. He's, he's showing us how to receive this letter as one who is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way he introduces himself challenges the way we introduce ourselves. We often introduce ourselves in a manner that sheds the best possible light on us. Maybe that's our family or our relationships or our work, or our accomplishments. 
What is that thing that you almost, as soon as you get your name out of your mouth, you want to tell other people about you so you can control at least a little bit the way they think about you? James could have played some impressive cards that not a one of you could have played. He could have played some impressive cards, but he chooses to see himself and introduce himself as a servant of the one true God. He could have called us to submit to his leadership. He could have called us to bow down to him as as the brother of Jesus, but he calls his audience to hear him as one of God's servants. He didn't throw his weight around. He submitted to God and he served God. He wrote this letter for the church's good and with the humility of a servant. Does that sound like anybody else in Scripture? James's mind had been changed from the worldly thinking that comes naturally. To introduce yourself in the best light possible is natural to the natural man. But he introduced himself in a way that shows that his mind had been changed by what Jesus taught, especially in Mark 10. Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. James has seen, James has heard, James has been transformed by Jesus Christ, the one who is our good news. James saw that he was wrong. James saw that he was a sinner in need of a Savior, and he saw that salvation in Jesus Christ. He changed his mind, and he clung to Christ. His repentance wasn't just a beginning work, it was a completing work. It caused him to think differently about Jesus, and it caused him to think differently about himself and the way he worked in other people's lives. Brothers and sisters, this is the work of the gospel in every one of us. At one point in your life, you're a sinner and you think that you're okay with God because you're pretty good. And then the Spirit comes and reveals to you that that's not true. You've broken God's law. You've sinned against law and just sinned against God. And you've committed sin against the one true and loving Maker. And then you change your mind about Jesus and you say, Oh, Jesus, you aren't just a good teacher. You aren't just some historical figure. You aren't just somebody we watch weird movies about at Easter time. You are the Lord. And unless you lay your life down as a ransom for mine, I have no hope of being right with God. And that work of repentance, that act of repentance, that movement of believing Christ for who He is equals our salvation. And it also equals this continuing work of repentance in our lives. And we see that in James. He didn't just change his mind about Jesus. He changed his mind about everything else. We see that all here as James introduces himself. I've got to keep moving and we're never going to get out of verse 1. <laughs> Not that that would be bad. but uh, After James introduces himself, he addresses his intended audience. James doesn't simply write to whom it may concern. He sends greetings to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Now, as James addresses the 12 tribes, tribes this may sound strange to you but if you know your way around the bible you know that the 12 tribes take us back into the old testament take us back to the 12 sons of israel the 12 sons of jacob and he takes us back to the people of god according to the old testament many commentators lean into this address of the 12 tribes And they see that James is is particularly writing to Jewish believers. 
And I don't contend with that. I think that's accurate to say that James is primarily writing to Christian believers. But I think it's important to see that that isn't all that's lining up here. James isn't limiting himself to Jews when he writes to the 12 tribes. Because Peter says something very similar in the first verse of his first epistle. He says, To those who are elect exiles in the dispersion, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with His blood. James may have primarily had Jewish believers on his mind, but this in no way excludes Gentile believers like us, who are likewise strangers in this land. We share that in common with Jewish Christians. We are strangers in this land, especially according to Peter's words, we are those who are foreknown by God the Father. We are those who have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We are those who have been united to Jesus Christ by faith and await our true home in a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. James may have particular Jewish believers in mind, but what he says in no way excludes Gentile believers. James and Peter both address audiences in the dispersion. You may see that word and think, whoa, what is that? The dispersion. The most basic way of understanding this description is to see this audience as people who have been scattered from their homes and scattered from one another. Now, this idea of people being in the dispersion, this isn't the first place we see that. We also see it before Christ's death in John 7, 35, where it's a reference to Jews who have been scattered from their home in Palestine all over the Roman countryside to escape persecution. But that's not the same dispersion that James is writing to. James is writing to Christians who have been dispersed. And so it's more right to see this, these 12 tribes in the dispersion as Christians who've been kicked out of their home because of their faith in Jesus Christ. People were scattered. Christians were scattered. The church was scattered due to the persecution of men like Saul and those same people who crucified Jesus. These are the people that James is writing to. As Americans, you and I have enjoyed a lengthy season of faith in Christ without violent persecution. But you and I need to remember that we are strangely blessed people in this way. Like, really strangely blessed. Not only strange in the history of the church, but strange even now in the world. If we were to line up all of the Christians in the world living today and say, those of you who face violent persecution on a regular basis, go to this side. And those of you who never even thought about violent persecution, go to this side. We would be in the minority. Right? We would be the strange ones. But whether we are violently persecuted or not, Peter calls Christians sojourners or strangers. So whether you would be amongst the group who fears violent persecution or not, it doesn't matter in a sense because you are a sojourner, you're a stranger, you're a traveler, you're a resident alien in this world as Jesus prays in John 17 about his disciples. He says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them all of them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So brothers and sisters, I don't mean to make you feel feel strange or somehow unchristian because you don't fear or face violent persecution. Whether you face violent persecution or not, you are a stranger. You are not of this world. This is not your home. And the world hates you to one degree in one way or another because you are of Christ. So, all this needs to shape how we receive 
everything that James says. We receive this letter written to a dispersed church. And as we receive it, know that these words were not written to people living easy lives. I'm spending a lot of time in some of these nitty-gritty address portions because I think it's super important that you see that this letter was not written to people who were lazy sitting by the pool. These are words given by God to a scattered church who needed to know how to live as sojourners and strangers in this world. Keep these things in mind. It's important that we remember, and I will do my best to remind you of who James is and who the 12 tribes in dispersion is as we go through this letter because it's incredibly important that we remember these things as we interpret what James is saying. Look now with me to point number two, verses two through four, a motivating imperative. So remember, these people are not living easy lives. Life is difficult. And as we come to verses two through four, we meet our first commands, our first imperatives from James to this church enduring great difficulty. Unlike Paul, James doesn't spend much time greeting or thanking the church. James is motivated to speak clear words of guidance and action to these hurting believers. James is the kind of guy that says, I'm going to punch in the time clock and I'm going to start working. He's not the guy that feels like we've got to have a little time to get to know one another. He's not the kind of teacher that goes around the room and says, tell me something about yourself. What's your favorite type of ice cream? He's not that kind of guy. He says, James, 12 tribes, here's what I need you to do. This may be part of James's personality, But I think we need to read the way James speaks to these people as important to the people that he is speaking to. This persecuted church needs to know how to live as sojourners and strangers. The book of James, many of you know this, this book is heavy on imperatives and commands. Do this. Do this. Don't do this. It's important that we observe that times of difficulty and times of grief hear me, are not times for us as Christians to simply hide away and pile on as many comforts as we can. We are a people who need to be obeying. We need to receive words of command even when we're hurting. How we live when we feel beaten down is incredibly important. Do you hear me? This church is going through a hard time. Life has been difficult. Their prayer list was long. And James says, let me tell you how to live. And many of us think that when we go through hard times, that this is the time where we just sort of like, I'm sure God knows all the hard things that are going on in my life, and He'd be okay if I just curled up in a blanket. I want to highlight this observation because each and every one of us is either currently in a situation or will soon be in one where we will feel beat up, we will feel run down, and we will want to just hide away. We will look at our grief and our loss and we'll excuse ourselves from spending time in the Word. We'll excuse ourselves from joining other believers in worship. We'll excuse ourselves from forgiving other people and from showing mercy to others because we can't see past our own suffering. We will look at our trials and difficulties and wrongly see them as an excuse from living the Christian life. As a pastor, as a Christian, we all should be talking to one another and saying, where were you on Sunday? Or how's your Bible reading going? Or how can I pray for you? And it's often the case when you talk to somebody 
who hasn't been in worship or isn't reading the scriptures or isn't participating or is going through a hard time is that they have excuses. Right? Somebody asked me, Drew, how's your Bible reading going? And the reality is it's been a week since I've been in the scriptures. I've probably got an excuse for that. But what James says to the 12 tribes in this dispersion, and he comes at them with a command, is he's saying, you don't have a good excuse. There are no good excuses from living the Christian life. That may seem harsh, that may seem hard to swallow, it may seem hard to understand, but listen. The kind of self-pity and depression that leads to excusing ourselves from active actively following Jesus is deadly. I wish I could speak without stuttering. The kind of self-pity and depression that leads to excusing ourselves from actively following Jesus is deadly. If you've got a venomous viper hanging off of your arm and someone comes to you and says, oh sweetie, it'll be okay. This is not the way we respond to these kinds of things, right? It's loving to respond strongly to someone who's flirting with something deadly, yes? James is blood earnest to get us up, to get us moving, to get us growing, even in our hard seasons. What does James say? He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Take note that James says, when you meet trials. It would have been easy for these believers who had been dispersed through persecution to be confused and disoriented, right? When you go through hard times, when something sideswipes you, it's hard to find your bearings. Where am I? This trial is so incredibly hard to understand. I'm confused. You and I can get confused by trials, but James doesn't say if you meet trials. He says when you meet trials. So brothers and sisters, hear me. Trials will come. The trial that you're in right now doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It doesn't mean you've somehow done something wrong. Trials will come. We shouldn't be surprised when the church faces opposition from some governing entities. Some people, I think, are far too surprised to find that the state wants to tell the church how they can be. I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying anything good or about it, but I'm simply saying we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised that following Jesus feels like an uphill battle most of the time. The Apostle Paul agrees with James when he writes to Timothy, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We might look at this persecuted church that James is writing to and think the trials that he's talking about are major life-changing events. But notice that he's talking about trials of various kinds. He doesn't limit it to, hey, y'all in the dispersion. That whole dispersion thing was quite the trial. Let me talk to you about the dispersion. He says, let me talk to you about trials of various kinds. Sometimes we can look at the intense suffering that Christians go through and think that our own difficulties don't count. But that isn't what James says. He's talking to believers who have been scattered. They've been dispersed. And he's not only talking to them about the dispersion, he's talking about the wide variety of trials that they are facing in the midst of being Christians who've been dispersed. You and I don't need to be kicked out of our homes to be able to connect with these words. James isn't interested in narrowly defining trials. I've been in conversations where somebody's a Christian is going through a trial, and they're, but they've got this tiny little thing that is really bothering them. 
and they feel like they can't ask for prayer because like, I'm not going anything through anything like you or you or you. But James isn't talking about only the big stuff. And he doesn't seem to care to define what a trial is. He just says various trials. He knows that trials come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and he's speaking to all of them. His only real definition of a trial is that which tests our faith. You don't need to think of a test of faith as some sort of crazy major life crisis where we stop believing that God exists. A trial is a test of faith, and a test of faith is an event that simply makes following Jesus harder. A trial is simply a person, a place, a thing, an event that makes following Jesus harder. Losing your spouse is a trial. Not finding a spouse is a trial. A lot of times, living with your spouse is a trial. Not being able to have children is a trial. Having children is a trial. 2020 seems like one trial after another. But lest we forget, 2019 was the same way. And if the Lord should tarry, 2021 will be full of trials. Life is full of difficulties that make following Jesus harder. And these trials tempt us to give up. They tempt us to throw it all away and go a completely different way. They tempt us to give up getting early to spend time in the Word. They tempt us to not be with the saints. They tempt us to pursue comforts instead of Jesus. They tempt us to pray for easy lives instead of help to keep believing Trials make us want to quit or at least take a break from the Christian life. Living by faith is harder in trials, whatever those trials may be. And James want to, wants to speak clear, motivating words to us in our trials. What does James say to the Christian going through a trial? Count it all joy. Now, if you're, if you're sore if you're hurting, if you're maybe particularly bitter this morning, and you were hoping God was going to encourage you, count it all joy doesn't feel particularly encouraging, does it? But brothers and sisters, let me remind you that the Spirit of God knows what you need better than anybody else. This is not a command... The scriptures are not commanding us to find some sort of sick pleasure in pain or to laugh at funerals. To count it all joy does not mean you have a stand-up comedian at your wake. This is not what it means. The Holy Spirit is calling Christians to change the way they think about trials. Whatever count it all joy means, I'm willing to wager that that's not how you naturally think about trials. To count trials as joy means we must stop thinking about them as meaningless and without purpose. It means we need to stop seeing them as unnecessary ingredients in our lives that need to be removed as quickly as possible. I hate to say, so many of my prayer requests reveal the reality that I don't call it all joy. I don't count it all joy. God, I'd really like it if, if my, wife, my wife was working at 100% all day, every day. My kids never disobeyed me. That work was easy. Money was abundant. The sun always shined. But in reality, I'm simply saying, God, don't give me any trials. To count it all joy means to change your mind about trials. Now hear me, don't, this does not mean we stop praying for healing. This does not mean we stop asking God to take away thorns in our side. But it means we change the way we think about these trials while we are, are in them. James goes on to say, you know that these tests of your faith produce 
steadfastness. I love that James can say, you know. You know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Can that be said of you? Could I stand up here as a teacher among you and say, you know, you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Do you say that you know that God intentionally develops your faith in him through hardships? Do you know that? That you don't grow in godliness apart from hardships? Do you know that? Do you believe that the goodness of hardship is that it grows your faith in Christ? Do you know that? Do you know that the difficulties in your life that you often pray God will take away are often left there so that your relationship with Jesus can be matured and improved? You and I need to know and be reminded to see our trials through this lens where we know that our trials have purpose and that our trials increase our steadfastness. This way of looking at hardship is not unique to James. You're not just going to hear these words in the book of James. This is central to the way of thinking all over the New Testament. Paul writes in Romans 5, we rejoice in our sufferings. Do you see how similar that is? We rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, Now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of jesus christ we grow in christ likeness and god is glorified as we endure trials as we endure these trials and as we hold on the promises of god by faith we grow in Christ-likeness, and God is glorified. This reality is central, and it's foundational. It's not an elective class. This is foundational, required reading, required learning for every Christian. This is absolutely necessary to Christian discipleship. The call to count trials as a joy is not a command to find physical sickness as fun. It's not a command to find financial stress as your brand new hobby. We are being commanded to look beyond the trial that we are in and to see our hardships in light of the blessings they bring. Christians don't go to the doctor and say, oh goody, I hope it's cancer. Right? That is not what, what James is calling us to. But Christians can get the diagnosis of cancer and say, I'm going to count this joy because I know that God would not put me in this trial if it wasn't for my good. We are commanded to look beyond the trial. This is like thinking about your job and your paycheck, right? There's a sense where you're supposed to enjoy your work, but there's probably a very real sense where you quit your job if there's no paycheck on Friday, right? So I just keep going because I know the paycheck's going to be there, okay? Not a lot of us are farmers here, but there's a sense where you don't sow seed. You don't go through all the hard work to get the field ready if there is no harvest, and what Jesus is saying, what James is telling us, what Paul has said, what Peter has said, is that trials are sown seeds. And those sown seeds reap a harvest that we can take delight in, that we can rejoice in. James doesn't stop at saying, look beyond your trials and find joy there. 
James goes on to call us, command us, to let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James is telling us that one of our temptations will be, will, will be to think that a little endurance is all we need. We'll be tempted to think that a couple trials, a brief hardship will be good enough. How many of you prayed, all right, Lord, I learned the lesson of this sickness. Okay, God, I'm a little more patient. Don't you think you can make my kids like do the right stuff? But letting steadfastness have its full effect means that you and I are going to suffer more frequently. It means that we're going to suffer for longer periods of time. It means that the pain is going to be more than tolerable and that our trials are going to go beyond what we think is reasonable. Right? Many of us would say, I'm willing to suffer for the Lord. To a point. But understand that the Lord has good purposes for you in your trials. He doesn't cut them short. He doesn't leave them there too long. The Lord will manage your trials to your perfection, to your completion, so that you won't lack a thing. The steadfastness that comes through trials can do a little work in us, but you and I are far from the completion and the perfection that God wants to do in us. Each of us, each and every one of us, is far, 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 far from the Christ-likeness that God wants to work in us. Many of us think that at this point in our Christian lives that all we need is a fresh coat of paint. Maybe just some new hardware on the cabinets. And you're completely baffled when God starts pulling walls down. Brothers and sisters, understand that God knows when you need a sledgehammer God knows when you need a sawzall. And God knows when you need a fresh coat of paint. So don't be completely baffled when the Lord says you need to be remodeled to make you like Christ. Your humility, your awareness of how far you have to go to be like Jesus will help you in the day of trial. Because you can know that the Lord's got a lot of work to do in you. And that's why this trial isn't over. And that's why this trial hurts so much. And that's why these trials seem to gang up on me. The Lord is doing a good work in us. God is conforming us to the image of His Son. You and I need many trials. We need lengthy trials. We need acutely painful trials to take us where He wants us to be. What trials are you enduring right now? Do you believe that that trial, those trials are in your life to shape you and make you more like Jesus? I didn't just ask if that was the right answer on this exam. I'm asking you if you believe that you don't have enough money because God's making you like Jesus. I'm asking you if you believe that you've got particular family members because God's making you like Jesus. I'm asking you if you believe that you and your spouse have the same issues over and over and over because God is using your spouse like a piece of sandpaper to smooth you out and make you more like Jesus. Do you believe that? The Scriptures call you and me to be changed in our thinking about the trials that we are enduring. Do you view your trials as opportunities to increase your comforts 
or as an opportunities to increase in godliness. What's your knee-jerk reaction to a trial? Grumble? Complain? Find a solution? Call the doctor? Finding a solution, calling a doctor might be good things. Grumbling and complaining is not, ever. I need to hear this, so just bear with me. I'm saying this out loud so I hear it. Grumbling and complaining is a sin. I don't know if that applies to you at all, but it sure applies to me. Is your knee-jerk reaction, wow, life is hard, I need to go get something to make it less hard. Or is your knee-jerk reaction, wow, life is hard, God is using this to make me more like Jesus. In a sense, we all think this way, right? In a sense, we all see trials as a, as a void, as a need for something at least. And many times we think of trials as a need for godliness. The unfortunate thing, and this is where I think I want to really press in and I want you to change your mind, the need for godliness is you. Right? My marriage would be so much better if my wife was godlier. If my kids were godlier, man, that trial would go away. No. That trial in my life is because I'm not godly enough. And God in His loving kindness hasn't simply saved me from my sins. He's called me to follow Him. And He's shaping me for the rest of my life. So when the doctor calls and says, we're not real sure why you're feeling this way. Or when the letter comes in the mail and says, finances are hard. Being an adult is hard. Your knee-jerk reaction, if you're going to be in line with the Scripture, is God is making me more like Jesus. I need to endure. And I need to keep enduring so that steadfastness can finish its work in me. When was the last time you changed your mind? I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for Jesus Christ who always counted it joy when he faced trials of various kinds. And I'm thankful that he offered up his ungrumbling, never complaining self so that his righteousness could be mine by faith. And he could offer his body so that I could be forgiven the sin of grumbling and complaining and failing to count it all joy when I face trials of various kinds. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is good. Your sins are covered in Him. And now, with blood earnestness, hear James call you by the power of the Spirit to change your mind the way you feel about the trials in your life.